Now we have uh, a set of three lessons which go through um, in somewhat less detail the other classifications. We did sort of in some detail the two basic database classifications, SQL and NoSQL. Now we come on to the other use case classifications. Um, well, we pointed out the geographic information system um, classification, and that's um, very important because so much big data is labeled by space, three dimensions and time, possibly just space, but typically space and time. <coughs> now space and time can be on the Earth, macroscopically in the atom, macroscopically in the cosmos for astronomy, and when you have things organized by space, you know that different points in space are distinct. And if they're a long way away, uh, that means something different from if they're close to each other. So a geographical information system is designed to display spatial um, or so-called geolocated data um, so that you can um, get an insight as to what's going on by just browsing uh, as you're very familiar with Google Maps or Google Earth or um, Microsoft Virtual Earth. Um, use cases 43 and 44, which we went through, which were the uh, polar science and uh, uh, earthquake science applications. They have map-based illustrations. Although in some physics cases, um, we don't have GIS because in the, you know, if you're dealing at the very shortest scales, a map is not so useful. So particle physics does not use that. Um, and um, obviously, even when you're doing material science, um, then uh, you will have simulations which um, would be need to be visualized in visualized in three dimensions, but you wouldn't actually use a GIS. GIS are for the special type of three dimensional applications where the, the sort of glow, the view of a map is a useful way of thinking. Um, if you noted here the Open Geospatial Consortium, it's enabling uh, these GISs to work well. Um, by setting standards and establishing methodologies so that uh, the different producers and owners of geolocated material can present that material in a way that uh, can be used. Yeah. <coughs> so you can have the same map with data from NASA, Google, US government, um, your favorite foreign country, and so on. Here's um, on the on the right here we have a nice example from use case 44 of the um, of an earthquake simulation. This is the Quake Sim website, which uh, has a lot of uh, information of predicting or looking at the consequences of earthquakes. And one uh, signature of an earthquake is. Uh, GPS sensors, their movement uh, which they detect can be a signature of an earthquake. And uh, here we have a map with little uh, symbols as to where the GPSs are. If you click those symbols, then you'll get a lot of information, including the actual time series from that uh, GPS. Then over at the uh, top left, we get something different. It's still three dimensions, but it's a typical three dimensional simulation. Uh, this is use cases 11 and 12, the material science ones. Where um, here we have a nanomaterial, and we still use 3D simulations, but not a map. We just uh, simulate the structure of the material. An exciting case which I really like is this: uh, is the Internet of Things. Remember, there were 24 to 75, or maybe. Um, if we ignore, if we take all devices, including those which are not on the internet, 200 billion devices by 2020. And here we have a sort of schematic of how those devices are arranged. Um, you have a cloud. The devices communicate via the internet with the cloud. The cloud does the processing, 
Uh, they accept the data like the connect, they get the data, the images from the connect and processes them and make decisions. In the case of the one of the um, stuff presented here on the uh, left, this is associated with uh, actually uh, use case 43, the uh, um, Croesus project where you have sensor radar sensors which are large. These are essentially large internet um, things, um, and uh, those, in fact, we see I put in the cloud sensors as a service. The actual signal processing for that uh, problem, and um, you could use MapReduce here to do the processing of all possible sensors. You wouldn't do you want to do a Lego ro ro robot, a smartphone, and connect all at the same time, but you would. Uh, do groups of them and uh, integrate them and fuse them and all sorts of things. So <coughs> clouds, as we mentioned, are perfect for um, the Internet of Things because the easiest thing to do on a cloud is to have a single virtual machine um, <coughs> without any uh, direct, highly correlated parallelism. And exactly what the Internet of Things does, because every Internet, everything on the Internet of Things is relatively small, and therefore it is natural to associate it with a single cloud process in a single virtual machine. <coughs> that often you could such a virtual machine, uh, when you have a sensor that's only producing data uh, at, a, at a, you know, once a minute or something, or once a second, then it's a waste for that virtual machine just to process one sensor, it can probably do. Uh, a thousand such sensors or something like that. And here we have this, this model underlies robotics and the, um, actually underlies the smartphone revolution. That's why smart, smartphones are smart, because of the cloud and because you have this model of cloud controlled uh, things. Um, so here it points out the cloud records the data, controls the devices. Acting, giving a, essentially becoming a point of source of intelligence, either by doing sensor specific computations or just accessing the world. Your smartphone, when it brings up a browser, is using the cloud to search the world. Um, this is a diagram I've often used, and it illustrates quite a lot of things. As we'll point out later on, it indicates, illustrates data fusion. Around the top, the left and the bottom, we have typically sensors or maybe <coughs> other so-called so, so services. A service is anything which receives messages and spits out messages, anything electronic. And um, these um, Sensors and other services, and Hadoop clusters, and grids, and compute clouds, and webcams, and telescopes, and databases, large LHC uh, detecting device, dot, 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 satellites. They pour out data. Those data go through analytics. Those analytics live in so-called filter clouds. A filter is here actually the same word as map. And map reduce. You could actually call map reduce filter reduce. Uh, filters are actually a somewhat more common term in the signal processing uh, sensor world. Filters take data and make new forms of data. And in fact, as we've discussed in the introduction to data science, you always have this pipeline. Raw data goes to data, you sometimes combine those two. You always have data goes to information, where information is the uncontroversially um, processed version of data. Knowledge goes to deep analytics, the machine learning built in, where you can often distinguish between knowledge and wisdom. And then you have uh, sometimes at the same level as wisdom decisions. And this pipeline is shown on this figure. Um, and it's just data pouring from everywhere, getting put put back into itself and put back into the cloud, into different clouds, pouring through services, which can be one, it can be a single service, or here we have the concept of a discovery cloud, which is integrating things together. And then we have here up at the top uh, right, we have the people with the portal, which is receiving this information, which is then 
received in a fashion which is fused to optimize the chance that the person using the bottle will be able to make good decisions and good discoveries. Here's an example of a fusion um, or a sensor control interface, which we built a few years ago with a friend of mine, Alex Ho. Um, and we have Lego robots, actually some in Hong Kong and some in this time at the conference in Irvine. And uh, these are actually geolocated, so it's actually got uh, uh, GPS devices, which are then read out and then they're recorded automatically on this uh, portal. This is an example of the discovery portal. On the uh, right here, we have the list of all the various sensors we're looking at. We have various commands on the, uh, on the left. And then we have these um, displays, which are the outputs of the sensors or data about the, about the sensors. Here we have webcams, obviously we have webcams run, sitting on Lego robots and running around and taking pictures of other Lego robots and so on. And so this is an example of, um, of the type of discovery portal that you would want in this case here. This was work done from the uh, Department of Defense, the US Air Force. This is how you would make your decisions, the type of a vision as to how you would design the interface to uh, large scale uh, sensor systems. These are uh, divisions into use case classifications one, two, and three are slightly um, uh, ad hoc, uh, they're just uh, uh, to get, give you a break so you don't have to um, listen to me talking too often. Um, we really need to do MOOCs differently. In fact, I think uh, other companies, more professional companies do this. We need to distinguish the actor who presents the MOOC from the, um, um, the scientist like me who prepares the MOOC. Uh, here we're making them the same thing, which are traditional in universities. But that's certainly not how uh, recorded books are done. It's not how movies are done. You have writers are separate from actors and so on. Anyway, you unfortunately have to listen to me at the moment, and we don't have a, a, a nice uh, actor or actress to uh, present it to you. Okay, so you do get these breaks here. So here we have a break. Enjoy it. <laughs>